Hey everybody, it's Angie and welcome to Hot and Flashy. In today's video, I've got the answers to all the questions you left for me back on Tuesday when I asked you to give me questions. So um, you guys are very curious people. You left over 700 questions and so I'm going to give you the answers to them today. I am going to break it out into sections because there were a lot on, you know, personal stuff. Then there were a bunch on skincare, a bunch on diet and exercise, then some on menopause. So I'm going to break those out and kind of group them together. And I will put time codes in the information box below the video, as well as in the first comment below the video and I'll pin that to the top so you can find it easily. So just wanted to say thank you for submitting all your questions. You guys are the best audience. You're also nice. Can I just say what wonderful people you are? And thanks for being kind in your asking. So um, the number one question with 62 thumbs up was from Claudia Glows. Um, she says, if your husband is not too shy, would you introduce him to us? I think many of us want to meet Angie's other half. And there were a lot of questions like that about my hubs and my kids and how come, you know, you guys never see them. And the reason for that is when I started my channel, I recognized that YouTube was a public forum. And as a public forum, I was willing to put myself out there, but I wasn't willing to put my family out there. When I started, my kids were 15 and 16, both girls. I love them to pieces and I didn't want anyone to be criticizing them because that's a hard enough time in a girl's life. You know, when you're 15, 16, you're like in high school, it's so awkward. You're, you know, trying to figure out your life and your mother's on YouTube and then you're on YouTube and people are saying mean things or they're saying nice things. I mean, it can just be a lot. So I had decided from the very beginning to shield my children from that. And so that's why you really have never met my kids. Um, same thing for the hubs. It's not that he needed to be shielded from it, but I felt like I was starting a channel that was a place for women. And I didn't really set it up to be about me and my relationships or me and my personal life or me and, you know, me personally. I am still, even though I'm out here on a public platform, I'm still a fairly private person. So that's why you never saw the hubs and why the answer to the question would be, um, he's not too shy, but I have made a conscious choice not to feature my family on the channel. But I know you guys are like, well, Next question then, move, move on Angie, because we've all noticed the rings. So second most um, popular kind of question, and I like the way this one was asked, so I'm gonna read this one, is from Forever Young. She says, I'm just going to say it. Girl, your wedding ring disappeared off your ring finger this spring and was replaced with a great looking middle finger ring. What gives? If it's what we think it is, so many of us have been through the same and totally support you. If it's just a change of jewelry, then great choice of middle finger rings. It's beautiful. Either way, change can be made into a good thing, a totally new adventure, peace and love. So um, yes, all of you who have been curious about the change in rings, what's happened, um, thank you so much for your concern. I have actually gotten a lot of DMs directly from you and lots of comments, questions over the last couple of months about it. Um, and to answer the question, yes, it is what you think it is. Um, I did get divorced and um, I didn't come forward with that until now because now my divorce has become final. And I didn't feel that I was at liberty to talk about it before that um, for a lot of reasons. <laughs> I won't be forthcoming with any details about what happened with the marriage, what happened with the divorce. All I'm going to say is that this is a public forum. My kids watch it, their friends watch it, my family, my friends, his family, his friends, him. You know, coming to the decision for it to be over was a difficult one. And it took a long time. It took a long, long time. And then once the decision was made, actually, getting divorced also took a long time. So I've had this off for three months and now it's time to put that behind me and move forward. So I never expected to be 57 and single. I never wanted to be 57 and single, but this is where I find myself. And so this is 
the hand I've been dealt and it's the hand that I am going to deal with and I can't say that I'm you know crushed by it I feel a lightness I feel happier I feel better um, I think that the future is going to be better for both of us uh, probably you know the hardest thing about it was having to tell my kids and break their hearts and that was you know as a mama bear <laughs> that is not an easy thing to do so um, but they seem to be okay with it you know they're adjusting yeah it's hard all the way around but I thank my lucky stars every day that I have you guys <sighs> because can I just tell you that being able to <laughs> I wasn't going to cry but I thinking about you guys and my kids why is this making me cry right but what kept me happy and and you know feeling loved and valued and joyful every day was being able to get up and do this like having you guys to talk to every day especially during the pandemic where you know I went to divorce court in March like I had lived alone for a year before that so I knew what living alone was like and it was a hard adjustment but um, you know it was actually kind of nice and kind of freeing and it was good on the one hand it was hard on the other hand but I still could go out every day I could go to a store I could have lunch with my friends or I could zip down to visit my family um, having it happen in March and then have the pandemic shutdown happen has been so <laughs> weird and made it so hard like it's like the convergence of just total aloneness and um, you know that has been made much much easier by being able to be here on YouTube with you guys and so you guys coming to watch my videos and showing up every Tuesday and Friday and even if I don't post a video being concerned about me I think that's really sweet and nice and I think it means that you know we're kind of friends you know like I feel like you guys are my friends and I know that some of you feel like I'm your friend and I love that about YouTube you know, I've just loved, I love having all these friends all over the world that I've never met. And so I love it that even though you guys were asking me a tough question, you did it in a very loving and supportive way. So I thank you for that. And dovetailing in with that was this question. Um, many of us are busy working women with families, finding time to exercise and other commitments. And it's so hard to fit it all in. You frequently mention your girlfriends and I'd love to know how you make time to maintain friendships. And um, I would say that Friendships are one of the most important things in your entire life. I don't know where I would be right now without my girlfriends. They're your sounding boards, they're your comfort, they're your therapy, they can be your joy, they are people that you laugh with, that you talk about your body with, your hair, your kids. It's easy to get wound up in the I'm too busy for my girlfriends. I would say one thing is to always maintain a little slice of time for your girlfriends every week. I used to do a Friday lunch with my girlfriends. It would be a group of seven of us that we had a standing Friday lunch date. Um, something else that I would do is go to a movie with a girlfriend on a Sunday afternoon. Um, I know that we all think that we have to be with our family all weekend, but I like to <laughs> give my kids and my hubs the autonomy to cook for themselves to entertain themselves and to do other things without me. And so since my kids were little, I've always gone off and done things with my girlfriends. I have a group of girlfriends and we do chicks weekends together. We do chicks vacations together. And my kids and my hubs just had to get used to the idea that I was not gonna be 24 seven focused on them. There were gonna be times that they had to go to the grocery store, make their own breakfast, some of you are going to be like, well, maybe that's why your marriage didn't work out. You know, who, who knows? Maybe, but I doubt it. But, you know, my hubs was very independent as well. He loved his alone time. And so it was not a problem for me to go to a movie on Friday night or out for cocktails and dinner with girlfriends on Friday night. So I would often have Friday night with girlfriends, Saturday night with hubs. I just think it's really important to carve out those little bits of time with your girlfriend, whether it is currently on a Zoom call or just in a text message group. You know, just keep 
those relationships going and don't ever ever neglect them because there may come a time when you know they'll be so important in your life and they really are the best friends you'll ever have there are also a lot of questions about if i have kids how my parents are if i have brothers and sisters where i'm from if i am originally from massachusetts and why don't i have an accent so let's start with the daughters i have two children girls um, they are 22 and 23 right now. The older one will be 24 pretty soon. And they're both in college. One is studying to be a lawyer. The other one is studying to be a doctor, hopefully a dermatologist. Can't imagine where she got that. Um, but I am very, very proud of both of them. They are lovely young ladies, the joys of my life. Um, and I just love seeing them grow up into such wonderful young women. I have two dogs. I have a six-year-old black lab shepherd mutt mix um, and she is the sweetest dog ever. She is pure love. And then just at Christmas time I got a puppy. Why? I don't know. Um, and it's a Pomeranian which is so weird for me because little dogs are not my thing. I've always been a d big dog person. Either I forgot how hard it is to train a dog or he has just a different personality that I'm used to because I am used to bigger dogs, but he has been the hardest dog to train that I've ever had. And I know they say little dogs are difficult, but anyway, he's about eight months old now and he's just starting to turn the corner where I can see the light at the end of the tunnel and I'm like, oh yes, I think I think he's actually gonna be good. I think I could train this one. I think I could work with him because I like a well-behaved dog, I gotta say. So that's the kids, the dogs. Oh, a lot of people ask about the cats because I used to have all these cats appearing in my video well um, one of the cats was our cat but she went to live with my husband because he's more of a cat person the cats were always more his thing the dogs were always more my thing but she's happier now so that's nice for her so she's living with him and then the other cat that you saw in the videos from time to time was my daughter's cat that she got while she was at school and um, that's the cat with the really cool markings whenever I cat sit the cat sometimes it makes appearance in videos but I haven't been cat sitting in a while now that she has an apartment close to me she just leaves the cat um, you know I suppose if she goes on a longer vacation the cat might be here again but that's that and a lot of people asked if my family is proud of me and what I've accomplished on YouTube and of course the answer is yes I mean why wouldn't your family be proud of you my girls are really excited about it my parents are very proud of me my, my brother my sister I'm a middle child. I have a younger brother and an older sister. My entire family lives a couple states away in Connecticut. I'm in Massachusetts. And the reason I don't have an accent is because I was born in the Midwest. I wasn't raised here in Massachusetts, so I don't have the lovely Massachusetts accent. So I think that's all the personal stuff that you guys wanted to know. Okay, diet and exercise. A lot of people asked about my biceps because uh, I was putting on self-tanner in that video. And so a lot of people want to know about diet and exercise routine. I have done a ton of videos on my diet and exercise routine, covering everything from actually working out so that you could work out with me. I did three little workout videos. I do a what I eat in a day video every couple of years. I did a belly fat video, like menopausal belly fat, staying slim over 50. And um, that can all be found on this playlist right here. I'll also link it in the info box below the video. Not much has changed in that. I have always been fairly thin and not had to struggle with my weight, but I have been eating heart healthy and cutting things out of my diet that aren't good for you for, you know, 35 years already. So that's just part of how I eat and how I do it. I don't eat a lot of extra sugars. I've tried to cut those way down. I don't eat a lot of processed foods. Um, I've been able to cut a lot of that out. I don't eat a ton of carbs. I eat super clean, super healthy, and um, I work out three times a week. And so if you work out and you eat clean and you eat healthy and you don't give yourself a lot of places to cheat, you know, obviously you can from time to time. I mean, I technically can eat whatever I want, whenever I want, but I don't. But when I feel like I want to, I can because it's not going to make that big of a deal. So definitely, um, you know, being dedicated and committed to it is what works. You know, for me, it's that I want my body to function and be there for me as I get older because 
I'm the kind of person who I want to do what I want to do. You know, I paddleboard, I ride my bike, I garden, I do all this active stuff. I want to be an active person. And I don't want my body to be like, oh, ow, e, ooh, no, you can't do that because, you know, oh, you haven't taken care of me and so now I'm not there for you. So I'm there for my body now. I take care of it. I exercise it. I feed it well and it's gonna be there for me in the future with any luck. The biceps are from push-ups mainly. Uh, in my workout routines, there are push-ups in every single one. I know a lot of women don't enjoy doing push-ups, who does? But you start with the ones on your knees and you do as many as you can, and then you get to the point where you're like, these kneesy ones are so easy, I gotta move to my toes. Then you do get to your toes and you're like, oh God, I can't even do one. Well, you can, you can do one or two, right? And then you go back to your knees and you do the rest. And then the next time you try to do three, and then you go back to your knees and you do then four, then five, then three. You know, it's all about adding in gradually till you're up to the point where you can do 10 push-ups. And um, you know what, you can do it. I am a scrawny little string bean, but these, arms can do push-ups. I am not kidding you. Um, and could I do them in the beginning? No, but I've been doing this for a long time and I've worked up over time and I'm getting older, but I'm not decreasing the number that I'm doing. I do, um, you know, lifting individual dumbbells. Probably the, mo the heaviest weight that I lift now are either eight or ten pounders, something like that. For legs, it's the classics. It's squats, it's lunges, it is one standing one leg work with weights on the shoulders. Um, I also have a step up box that I use doing up and down on this you know box that helps. So it's all in the workout videos. I don't really like to design my own workouts. I let the pros do that for me, so that's why I do these workout videos. Another great resource is Fitness Blender here on YouTube. I hope they're still making videos. I'll put their link in the info box below the video as well. Mary Karen asks, I'd love to know your workout routine and diet. One year into menopause here and can't get a handle on it. Um, yeah, there's a reason for that because once you are in menopause and your body stops producing estrogen, your body's relationship with food and with where it places fat on your body and how able you are to develop muscle mass is completely different than it was when your body was producing estrogen. So you have to make a decision based on your own personal health history and your um, risk factors on whether you're willing to take estrogen, whether you should take estrogen, but I'm not saying you can't be fit and in shape without it, but it makes it a lot harder. And my personal experience going through menopause, I'm now postmenopausal, is that I spent the last few years goofing around with HRT, right? And when I say goofing around, I mean goofing around. Um, was on the right dose, then was switched to a lower dose, then was switched to an even lower dose, then went off of it, then went back on. I gotta say, before I was menopausal, had no problem building muscle mass, had no problem maintaining my weight with my usual diet and exercise routine. Became postmenopausal, had all kinds of problems maintaining my muscle mass, maintaining my um, flat stomach. Went on HRT, suddenly, oh, muscle mass and flatter belly. Then went off HRT, oh my God, fat depositing in the middle and can't build a muscle to save my life. Back on HRT now. Good muscle tone, flat belly. So there's definitely a correlation between the two. It is a personal journey. You have to figure it out for yourself between you and your doctor, whether it's right for you, it might not be. If it's not right for you and you're not gonna take estrogen, then if you really wanna have a fit body in menopause, you have to go the extra mile. You're going to have to cut things out of your diet, specifically a lot of extra sugars, a lot of carbs, and a lot of processed foods. And you're gonna to have to exercise more. It's just the way it is. There is no easy solution for this. The sugars, as it turns out, are the devil. And it's true, do a little research into it and you'll find out that all the big food companies have replaced fat with sugar and that's why we have the obesity epidemic that we do here in the United States. So getting away from processed foods that add all that sugar is number one on your list. But I know you can do it because 
I can do it and I've gotten used to it. And I think that once you make a commitment to it, you start doing it and then you get on a roll, then you're like, oh my gosh, this actually makes me feel good. And once you start feeling good doing it, that's when you'll make the true life change because it really is something, you don't want to just be on a temporary diet, right? It's like a slow, but it's a life change. And you want to be able to get there so that you can continue with it forever. And then you'll be much, much healthier going forward. All right, let's move on to skincare. There were a few, a few, there were a lot of questions, really specific questions about skincare. Um, there were a group that had to do with using tretinoin. And as you guys know, that is Retin-A. It is the most powerful topical anti-aging cream or you know lotion that we have. And it can really turn back the hands of time on your skin if you use it for a long time over time, but it can be really irritating. So a lot of the questions were like, how much peeling is okay? How much redness is okay? How much irritation is okay? In my book, none is okay, because when they did the research you know, years ago, they looked at whether the irritation and or the peeling was part of making your skin look younger, and they found out that it wasn't. And so you don't need to have those in order for it to work. So you should try to avoid that because who wants their skin to be red and cracked and painful and peeling and looking awful? Instead, you can just ease in slowly with it and take your time and not be in a hurry to have it make the changes in your skin, which I know is hard to do especially if you're already older and you want to see the changes happen today, but it's not going to happen like that anyway. I think like we're all victims of marketing that make us think that everything should work in a week. Believe me, if you took 50 years getting sun damage on your skin and now, you know, you've got the wrinkles to show for it, then it's not going to be like in a week, suddenly they're going to be gone. So anything that you're going to use is going to take time to work. So anyway, my video on that, I'll link here. It's about how to start with Retin-A or Tretinoin without irritation and also how to bring in other products for my skincare without irritation because, you know, a lot of acids together can cause irritation. You can use them together. Um, there are a lot of questions about some of the myths that are out there in skincare. And I have a myth busting video. That one I'll put right up here. I can only link five videos up here, so I'll put five and then I'll do the rest below. Another big topic on skincare was under eye bags and also under eye puffiness out here and below the eye bags that's called malar festoons um, this is really a question that you need to ask your dermatologist about malar festoons basically are a manifestation of sun damage and so that took you a lifetime to get. There really aren't any topical treatments for it. There really isn't much you can do about it. I would imagine a skilled injector could help the look of it with some well-placed filler. You may or may not want to go that route, but under eye bags, usually those are from either uh, water fluid retention under the eyes, or you can be puffy because of too much sodium. Fluids pool in that area, then you wake up and you have eye bags. They can also be hereditary or genetic if you have dark circles under there. So depending on what the cause is, it's more or less treatable. So the hereditary dark circles, there really isn't a topical or even I think in, in office treatment that can really help that much with those. Genetic puffy under eye bags, again, you got them because of your genetic makeup, so not much you can do about them uh, beyond, you know, surgical interventions. Ones that are caused from uh, too much fluid or too much sodium, obviously you need to reduce the sodium in your diet, but the other thing you can do is sleep with your head elevated. That helps the fluids to drain out of your face. A lot of people often ask me, like, why I don't have any under eye puffiness? It's because I sleep with my head elevated every single night and I sleep on my back to um, help me with chest wrinkles and also face wrinkles. So sleeping with your face mashed in a pillow with your head flat increases your under eye puffiness. So that's one way to do it. It's not easy. I do have a whole video on that as well that I'll link, um, you know, how to sleep on your back or how I train myself to sleep on my back. So there's that for those questions. Then there were a bunch of questions about turkey neck, what to do about turkey neck. Well, again, it depends on what is the cause of your turkey neck. Um, I'm not sure if this is considered turkey neck. I just have these little bands that are starting to sag down here. And, you know, that's just age and gravity. But one thing that can be done about that is Botox. I have not done it, but I actually was thinking about it because I am 
want to give it a try and see if it really works. Otherwise, turkey neck can also be from fat that has left your face and ended up down here, or you could have a genetic predisposition for it. If you have the genetic predisposition for it, then you need to consult a doctor. There are surgical ways to get rid of it. There are um, in-office interventions, injectables like Kybella and things like that. I mean, everything takes multiple treatments and costs money at the dermatologist's office. If you're looking for a cream that's gonna take care of it, it doesn't exist. I mean, I, I hate to like burst your bubble on these things, and I know these things like really bug you, but unfortunately, if you think of a cream, it really only works in the top layers of your skin. Um, anything that's over the counter, it can't penetrate deep enough to, not that it can't make a change in your skin, but it can't make, it can't lift something that weighs an actual amount, right? It's just skincare. It can tighten, it can soften, it can smooth, it can brighten. The in-office interventions are really some of the things that are really good at taking care of these things. So like Botox would be for wrinkles in the upper face, the forehead, the 11s, the crow's feet. Um, now they're finding uses for it in the neck as well. Uh, but filler would be for any kind of uh, like tear trough indents here, filling the cheeks. I got a bunch of questions about marionette lines over here. Filler can help with those. Um, filler can help with these nasal labial folds as well. You can reshape your jawline with filler. Um, I've seen some of that done. You can't do anything about turkey neck with filler or Botox. It's best to use an in-office procedure for that and definitely talk to your provider about what would be the best in-office procedure for you. I do have a playlist of all the procedures I've had done and what I thought of them with before and after pictures. I'll link that right up here so you can take a look at that. Let's take a look at some other questions. What's my skin tone? warm or cool and how can you find yours? Um, my skin tone is neutral so there are actually three skin tones that you can be. You can be warm, cool, or neutral. Neutral is kind of a mixture of warm and cool. The best way to determine is to look at your wrist and to look at the color of your veins. If your veins look purple to you then you would tend to be on the cool side. If your veins look green to you then you will be on the warm side. If your veins, like you can't really tell, they're just kind of a bluish color, then you might be neutral, which is what I am. All right, someone wanted to know about how to take care of dark spots on the face. The easiest and fastest way to get rid of like a, you know, one-off age spot that we all seem to have, which side, it's on the driver's side of the car right up here, is to go to your dermatologist and when you're having your annual skin check done, ask them to hit it with liquid nitrogen. Liquid nitrogen will freeze the spot, it will crust up, turn black, fall off, and within a week or two, it will heal up and the spot will be completely gone. That is the quickest and easiest. At my derm's office, they tend to throw that in as part of the service. Some derms will charge you extra for that, but um, that's the best. As far as other in-office treatments, if you have a lot of spots, you can go for an IPL or a BBL treatment. There were a lot of um, questions about those. I had IPL treatments done way back in the beginning of my channel. I love the first one. It seemed to take care of a lot of freckling all over my face that targets brown spots. And it really did seem to take care of a bunch of them. Uh, I did buy a package of four. I found them to be increasingly painful as I went, and she didn't offer me the numbing gel until I almost wasn't gonna come back for the third one. And then she was like, well, oh, I have numbing gel. I'm like, slap it on there, lady. Um, so she put on the numbing gel, and then I was able to do it, but I really found that the bang for the buck was in the first one, and the next three were just kind of like diminishing return. So like the first one, felt that it you know did well. BBL is basically the same thing. It's Those are not lasers, those are light treatments. Um, and then I've also had Fraxel, which really took care of a lot of the brown stuff on my skin. And the thing that you have to do is after you get any kind of a light treatment and you have it take off your brown spots or you have the liquid nitrogen, you have to have it take off your brown spot, wear sunscreen every day because <laughs> you've just paid money to have those things removed. And if you don't wear sunscreen, the sun is going to put them right back on your face. Um, so the way that I have been able to keep my skin getting no new age spots and no new sunspots, including on my hands, which I used to have a big sunspot there and I had it treated with liquid nitrogen, 
um, is that I wear sunscreen every single day on my face, my neck, my hands, every part of me that's exposed to the sun. I would say that sunscreen is really the one thing that is the multiplier in it because it really just keeps all that new sun damage from forming. So you're reducing the one thing that causes 90% of the skin aging down to almost none. It is a screen, so it does let some through. A couple of people wanted to know if when you're going on a sunny vacation, if I still use my um, tretinoin and my alpha hydroxy acids. And yes, I do. I have made such a commitment to my face skin that I'm really not at this point putting my face out in the sun that much. Even when I'm on a sunny vacation, I wear a big hat. I sit under an umbrella or a tiki hut. Um, I don't tend to be out in the sun that long. I used to be a big, as you know, roaster on the beach. I used to fry my skin every single chance I got. And now I'm a walking, talking billboard for why you shouldn't do that because the parts of my body that I haven't anti-aged are really just a mess and they're not looking good and that's you know that's on me i did that to myself but now that i'm at this age and i know the damage that sun can do i'm just not interested in doing more of it and one of the questions was well if i have my sunscreen on and i'm still getting tan what can i do to not get tan well, if you have your sunscreen on and you're still getting tan, it pretty much means that you're getting UVA damage because UVA will brown your skin. Most American sunscreens, their SPF value is for UVB and they're supposed to have an equivalent level of UVA coverage, but they don't test for that. So you don't really know. It's supposed to, but it's all done on a calculation. It's not actually tested in human skin like the UVB is. So what they've done with a lot of the sunscreens is that they've raised up the SPF to the point that it's super high and it allows you to stay out in the sun longer. So you're actually not getting burned, which is what the UVB does. It burns you, it causes redness in your skin. So since you're not getting the burn, your skin doesn't hurt, so you stay out longer. Unfortunately, you're getting more UVA, and so that's why you're getting the tan. So that actually is a sign of getting sun damage. So if you're out in the sun with your high SPF sunscreen on and you're getting tan, it means that you're actually doing more aging to your skin and potentially causing skin cancers later. I'm not telling you this to scare you. I'm telling you this because it's the truth of the shortfall of sunscreen in the world. I mean, it's great that we have sunscreen, it's better than nothing, but it's not the only thing that you should use. Even if you're under an umbrella, the UVA rays bounce off of the sand, they bounce off of water, they hit you multiple times from multiple directions. They're just a menace and they're always hitting you. If you're in your house, they're hitting you. So, you know, put your sunscreen on all the time, reapply often, go inside, seek shade, wear a hat, cover up, put on clothes. There are UPF 50 clothes that I love, get those and that's how you can protect your skin from the sun a little bit better. So there were a number of questions about YouTube, everything from why I started my channel to what kind of recording equipment I use to how I organize my time and come up with ideas for videos and um, what I would advise a friend who wants to start on YouTube, all kinds of YouTube questions. I feel like I could do a whole separate video just about YouTube. As a matter of fact, I did a whole separate video all about um, YouTube. So those of you who want to see my camera setup, my filming studio, my lights, and all that stuff, it really hasn't changed in a few years. I'll link that one if I have less than, I feel like I have five already up there, so I'll put it down here. Um, anyway, I'll link that so you can see what my setup looks like from behind the scenes kind of thing. As far as starting my channel, I started it seven years ago when I turned 50 and I was looking for skincare information for people who were actually old and actually had wrinkles and there was not much out there. And so I thought, huh, I wonder if I should do this. And I wanted to go get like an IPL treatment. So I filmed it and then I started my channel, came up with my name, decided to run it as a business right from the get-go. So I started from the beginning posting two videos a week and that was my goal. And back then I found that it was really easy to manage my time. I could pop off two videos a week, no problem, do the research, write it. And I was so much busier back then. I had two kids at home who were in like high school, middle school. I had hubs, you know, my dog. But anyway, my life was busy and very full and I could do all this, had YouTube channel, the blog, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook all going, and I had no problem doing it. Now, seven years later, oh, I 
don't know why, but I am so slow. It takes me so long to do everything else. When I'm researching things, I get like more into it, but I follow tangents more. Like then I used to be able to just cut it off and be like, okay, that's the end of your time today and get done what I needed to get done in that amount of time. Now everything seems to just be slipping into the next day and into the next day. So it has gotten harder to manage my time as I've gotten older. I also feel like there was a time there when my HRT was, you know, like I said before, kind of I was goofing around with it, didn't really know what was going on with it. And during that time, I felt like I was losing it. I felt like my brain was in a fog. I couldn't think clearly. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't speak right. Now that I've been like six months on my new HRT regimen, I feel like a different person. I feel like I'm starting to be able to manage my time better and get things done in a timely fashion now, but it's difficult. So I have a lot of calendars that I keep. I have a lot of notes. I have a whole notebook that I keep with just video ideas. And then I have a notebook of everything that I want to get done that day. So um, I have a schedule of, you know, my next few Instagram posts. I have a monthly schedule of what I'm going to film for YouTube that month. And then it requires, of course, the shopping for the products, the testing of the products, the filming, like what day am I going to film, the B-roll video, like for a Foundation Friday, all the testing days. What days are those going to be? Because that takes say three days out of a week. And then when I'm filming a finished video like this one, I need a day to film like to film videos, you know, to do the hair and the makeup and sit in front of the camera and film. Usually I'll try to film two videos, maybe three if I'm lucky. That's rare. Usually I only film one at a time, but sometimes I try to do two. That really eases up the time the next week. The way my schedule usually goes is I try to film one video or two videos over the weekend, either on Saturday or Sunday. Then I try to also film again on Wednesday, I try to film one or two videos every Wednesday. Then Monday and Thursday are my editing days, so I'm editing videos for the next day. Then I post Tuesday and Friday. Those days are mainly taken up with, um, you know, seeing how the video is doing, answering your comments, putting up the posts that go along with it, the Instagram, the Facebook, the blog, and the Twitter. Um, I have fallen behind on doing the Facebook and the blog lately because, you know, I gotta circle back to the divorce for a sec. It took so much time out of my day just to, you know, get the paperwork together and do all that stuff, and that was just so stressful. Um, that I feel like now it's like, oh, I'm actually enjoying having less to do in the day, but because of that, I'm also like doing less. I have been slacking the last like month or so. I've been just kind of like, it's a pandemic. You know, if I don't keep up with the blog or I don't keep up with the Facebook, the world's not gonna end. You know, people have other more important things that they're concerned with. So sometimes I let it slack and then other times I'm like on it. But that will take me like four hours in the morning just to chat with everyone, put up all the extra posts for everything and then um, I'll check back in a few times during the day and then every day I try to spend like an hour just looking through comments, answering comments. You know, I know some people try to DM me or email me because they want me to answer their question. I can't tell you how many messages I get in a day between DMs, comments below videos, emails, comments on Facebook. I mean, I am like have so many comments and questions it's so hard for me to answer them all. I know some people are like, you don't answer your DMs, do you? I'm like, yeah. I try to get around to as many as I can. Some I don't see. Sometimes people will ask me a question in October and I don't answer because I never saw it. And then they'll ask me another question in May. And then of course their October question is there. I'm like, oh gosh, I'm so sorry. I never saw your October question. And then I'll answer both. And they'll be like, well, thanks for getting back to me. I'm like, eh, did I try? So anyway, it's, it's hard. YouTube is a lot of time. It's a lot more time than you would think, especially once you add each of the extra social medias on. Each of those is like an extra day of work and who has the extra day. So that leaves me like one day, and like a half that I'm not working. And um, those times I like to spend with my kids, spend with my friends, you know, do my shopping or whatever I need to do, um, get my appointments in. So yeah, it's a lot. YouTube is a lot. It's a busy schedule, but I love it. It kind of keeps me out of trouble, I guess. <laughs> so. All right, there are a bunch of menopause questions, generally an update on what's happening with my HRT. I did an update video. The last one I did was I think last October, November. I'll link it. So really nothing has changed with the HRT except that I feel 
great on it. There has been not a downside yet, but it's only been like six months, but I do feel so much better. I'm so much clearer in my mind and my thinking. I'm sleeping a lot better. Again, HRT is a very personal decision and it's gonna depend a lot on your risk factors with your family and stuff. And so it's really a discussion you have to have with your doctor. It's really a decision that you need to be informed about. I am all for women being informed. So I highly recommend Dr. Barbie Taylor's channel here on YouTube, Menopause Taylor. You will learn more than you ever thought there was to learn about menopause. And I mean, let's face it, we are gonna spend half of our lives, maybe, in a, in a post-menopausal state. I mean, women used to turn 50, have menopause at 51, and be dead by 57 at the oldest. Well, now we're living into our 80s and 90s, and so that is 30 years, 40 years post-menopausal. And so you really need to be informed about what the changes are that are happening in your body because of lack of estrogen and what the um, health risks are that you haven't been taught about because of lack of estrogen. And again, I've done a video on this. I did an interview with Dr. Taylor to kind of bring these things all together in one quick place that you could watch. I'll link that as well. And I also have my full menopause journey in a playlist, so I'll put that down below as well. If you have any other menopause questions about me, I'm sure I've answered it in one of my menopause update videos. There were quite a few questions about maintaining a positive attitude, especially during the pandemic. Um, how do I manage my stress and anxiety? And um, I am very, very fortunate that I don't suffer with hugely high anxiety. Um, I do have experience with it though through other people and I know how debilitating it can be so I totally get it. Um, I like to take the long world view of things and that helps me to put everything in, pa in pandemic perspective I want to say um, because there have been pandemics before and uh, the world keeps spinning. The world that we live in it is so terrible and so wonderful and so confusing and so everything all at once. You can have the greatest love and the greatest pain and see horrible things and see beautiful things and that is part of keeping it all in perspective is that it's all part of life and if you let the bad things and the horrible things get weigh on you too much um, then you don't get to see the beauty in it. And so I feel like every day you have to balance it. It's okay to feel horrible for a little while, but eventually you gotta brush yourself off and get back to the business of life. I find that staying busy is the best medicine for just about anything. As physical beings, our mental health is very tied up in our physical health. Exercise is so good for you mentally because it releases endorphins and endorphins are feel good hormones that you know, light up your brain and make you feel good and reduce your stress and reduce your anxiety. So, you know, just doing a workout or going for a walk, like whatever, call a friend, that also produces endorphins. And so there's so many things that you can do to help yourself to relieve the stress and relieve the anxiety. But there are those times where you wanna just kind of be quiet and not get dressed and, you know, binge watch something. And that's fine too, but on an everyday basis where this is going on and on and on for months on end, you know, it's best just to keep on keeping on and do your life and just kind of stay busy. I can only tell you what works for me and what works for me is just, you know, keeping busy and doing what I love to do and doing things that make me feel better. Here are a couple questions that I really loved. The first one is, when was the last time you had the best day ever? And I gotta say, it was just a couple of weeks ago. My parents decided to come up to celebrate my daughter's birthday and she was just home from college. My other daughter came out from the city and I had my people with me. Oh. It felt so good to have my people with me, um, you know, because the pandemic, I haven't seen them very much over the last few months. And it really was the best day ever. Just 
having my people with me. It was great. And then the second question is, um, do you regret anything in life? My regrets really are things that I was afraid to do or afraid to try. There's some things in my life that I always wanted to do when I was younger or that I thought I wanted to be in my career and I was too afraid to try and I really regret being too afraid to try. But I feel like I finally got over that when I turned 50 and decided to start a YouTube channel. And I was afraid to try, but instead of doing my usual thing, which was to let the fear stop me from trying, I went for it. And I thought, well, I'll try it. And if no one watches in a year, I'll hang it up and, you know, to use another cliche, no harm, no foul. And I found that I loved it so much. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is so wonderful. Like, it wasn't that I had a ton of subscribers or was making any money at it, but I just loved it. I just loved the interaction with people and that people were responding to me and what I was putting out there. And that there were people who wanted to talk about the same things that I did because it was so weird. Like being a person approaching 50 with my girlfriends, I think it's more a, fu a function of where I live, that people are really all natural here. Um, but I would be asking people like, you know, what do you use on your skin? Do you have any anti-aging things like my skin? I don't like it. And no one had anything to tell me. No one had anything to share. And it was the things that I wanted to talk about and that I got really jazzed up about and that I wanted to look into. And I just couldn't find anyone to talk about that with, even though I had really good friends, it's just not what they were into. And so, finding this whole community of people out here who wanted to talk about the same stuff as me, I was like, ooh, there's, there's, I knew, that, I knew you were out there. I had a feeling you were out there and I'm so glad that you found me. So um, that's something that I don't regret. I will never regret starting my YouTube channel, but I do regret having fear before that of starting things. And I'm so glad that finally, when I turned 50, I was finally able to overcome my fear of failure, I guess. Isn't that the basic fear? You fear failure and so you don't even try. I never would have guessed that, you know, seven years later I would be at this stage. But as I said, it's been so rewarding and I so love it. All right, you guys, it's getting late. My candles went out. It's time for me to make some dinner and put this one to bed. I hope I answered enough of your questions um, and referred you to enough other videos that you can get the answers to your questions that I didn't provide here. So that is it for today's video, everybody. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate your watching and for asking all your questions and for all your support and all of your caring that you have provided to me through the comments. I really appreciate all that too. So hope you have a great day and I will see you in the next video. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.